All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Josh Fisher, and I'm a dreamer. And I have the honor of knowing a few of you, and some of you I met this morning for the first time. And I know that among us, we have a variety of people, creative people that like to dream. We have business owners, entrepreneurs, we have artists and designers, and some of us have families, we are raising children. And I think that it would probably be okay to say that we're interested in the community that we live in. We're interested in the future. We wouldn't do the things that we do if it wasn't for the dreams and ideas and visions that we have and the ideas for how we can make the place that we live better. Dreaming is really important and when you think about it, literally everything that we have, the clothes that we wear, the buildings that we're in, the jobs that we do, are all the product of someone else's ideas, for good or for bad. And so ideas really do have a powerful and profound potential to change the world. And so this morning, I'd like to spend a few minutes with you and talk about the idea of reverie and regeneration. Reverie is an interesting word. It means the state of being pleasantly lost in thought, daydreaming. Uh, a really hard word to build a presentation around because it could go in so many directions. But it's an interesting word and who doesn't like to just slow down and take a break from everything that we're responsible for in our day to day and to just dream and to think about the future and of what we can do. It's really tough though, uh, as entrepreneurs, for clients it's, and for companies, not the best thing to do on the job, to, to kind of get lost in thought. Uh, as a parent of three very young active boys, it's uh, really difficult at home to just find a moment to, to relax. Usually when I do, I'm like, okay, things are good, I can take a break, get a coffee. I love to draw and make art and to read. Uh, so I try to sit down and do that and then am brought back to reality realizing, oh, uh, the boys realize there's a bunny rabbit living in our rock wall and they're trying to hose it out. So <laughs> really tough to just disconnect at home. So finding the time to dream and to think about ideas is really tough, especially with everything that we have going on in life. Reveries gets even more interesting when you look at the history of the word. Uh, it seems like it's this word that has had two different uses. It originally has, has its roots in like madness and being used in sort of a demeaning, critical way to kind of, well, you're just being impractical, unrealistic, you know, kind of grow up. And I think we can relate to that as creative people, as entrepreneurs, when we have ideas and we share it, it can be kind of scary and they can get slapped down by Debbie Downers, people with, uh, that don't relate to it. Uh, and so if we had to illustrate it with two pictures, maybe we could show reverie as sort of this blissful, pure, just enjoying the moment type of uh, sound of music type idea. And on the other side, we can relate hopefully to the idea of the, the grumpy hobbit who was like, there's no dragons, I just grow up. Uh, so thinking about reverie in terms of our dreams and what we do with them has a lot of power. And so I'd like us to think about that this morning and to consider your dreams and your ideas, what you're doing in your business, what you're doing with your family and friends and how in our community, hopefully we can shift the balance to do positive, uplifting um, outcomes. And it made me think, where do I get the time to just disconnect and take a break? And maybe you can relate to this as well. Think on vacations. That's typically the place where we just get to relax and just enjoy the day. We usually go to places that are filled with nature, where we can just slow down and take time to enjoy the, the day, or we go traveling to other places. We leave the places that we live, and we just go look at steps and architecture and doors and markets and other places around the world. Or we'll go to theme parks or resorts, which are just kind of faking both of those things, and, but they're also fun and they're playful. Or we'll go to the places that we grew up, that we've left, and just to reconnect with family and friends. And it's interesting when you think about what these all have in common and what about these places allow us to daydream and to think. And it's interesting that really they're just, we go to places that are filled with nature, that haven't been messed up yet or destroyed. We go to places that have history and detail and character. And we try to connect with people and we slow down and we walk and we enjoy the cities that we live in. But to me, this is really depressing because then we come back home for the rest of the year, we just kind of accept where we live is like, well, this is just the norm. And it's the same thing from coast to coast. And literally our, design, our cities are designed to just rush us from home to work and we skip every place in between. So we don't connect with the people and places that we live in and we outsource our responsibilities to other people. And then we typically come home into neighborhoods that really aren't that friendly. 
and the majority of this space is just dedicated to cars or unproductive lawns. And we turn our backs to our neighbors, we go in our garages, and we just spend our time entertaining ourselves. So it's no wonder that we spend so much time doing this, and it's estimated that we spend almost four to five hours of our days now on phones. We live our lives almost 100% of our time inside buildings. And the buildings that we live in and occupy and develop, they take massive amounts of resources, energy, and water. And then the food that we bring into our homes, it has to travel almost 1,500 miles to, what we, uh, to our homes, and then we waste almost 40% of that. So I think if we bring it back to the word reverie, that's kind of crazy. That's kind of mad. And that's not the kind of future that I dream of and that I want to be a part of making. So I spent the last 10 years working at an architecture firm, helping to dream about a different type of a future. I work at a firm called McLennan Design. We're based on Bainbridge Island. And our practice was really founded on this dream of what if every act of design we do could help make the world a better place. Because we see in nature that if we just work with nature and we invite it back, it brings life. And we do that through something that we call regenerative design. And what that just simply means is we try to balance the need for development, for growth and progress with the idea of learning from nature. What if our buildings could collect their own water, their own electricity, and be healthy and supportive of life rather than not be supportive of life? Because we've come to a point as a humanity where we just depend on machines to make our buildings comfortable and we import a lot of our ingredients. And that results in spaces that really just aren't pleasant to be in. It's why we leave to go visit other places. And so our CEO and the founder of our company had this idea a few decades ago. What if our buildings could be different, the places that we live our lives? What would it look like to design buildings inspired by flowers? And so he put out this idea in this dream into the world called the Living Building Challenge. And the idea was not to just do a little less bad, but what's the most good that we could pursue as a people? And the idea that being what's in our buildings shouldn't give us cancer. It'd be a nice thing. <laughs> and I got to be part of this for a couple years and see it be adopted all over the world and hundreds of projects come online, buying into this idea and helping to grow it. And I got to spend the first couple of years of my career in the industry working in this building in Seattle and Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. one of the first living buildings built for an office building, and it has five stories of composting toilets, takes care of all of its waste within this footprint, gets all of its energy from the sun in the cloudiest city in the country. <laughs> and it was kind of like working in a fishbowl. We would have tour groups come in from all over the world just to see how this building operated. And it was kind of like a sunflower. Windows would open up to allow the breeze to cool the building down, close down when it wanted to keep the heat. And it was a really special place. And I got to work on projects like this, where we piloted ideas of what could we do with underutilized streets where there aren't parks and recreational areas. I got to come up with ideas of taking back streets and turning them into a series of places that collect water, have pollinator plants, and have edible landscaping so that you don't have to import your food from 1,500 miles. You could just go out and get an apple. So I got to see these ideas and dreams come to life and become a reality and used all over the world. And then we started our architecture firm, McLennan Design, to do this uh, at all scales. And we started with the house uh, for Jason and his family on Bainbridge Island called Heron Hall. And it's a cool project. And it was the first rainwater only residence in Kitsap County. We had to get that approved. And it gets all of its energy from the solar panels on the roof. The walls were built with the dirt that we dug up for the foundation. And it's a house that just really shows the potential for sustainable living and beauty and trying to spread this across the country. And so this house in particular, from the moment you arrive to the moment you go inside, we're trying to reuse materials, reclaimed wood, have ingredients that aren't going to give us cancer and cause us harm. We developed a cabinet line, which was the first red list free cabinet line in the country and designed it to just bring people together. But it was illegal to take care of our own problems. We wanted to take care of our own waste. So we had to work with the uh, municipality on Bainbridge to permit us to just have a composting toilet. But we did it. And it just shows that it's possible to build a home like this for people to live in. And this expanded across the country and was able to be a part of teams. And one example just to show was in the middle of the country in Ohio. We got invited out to this small town in Yellow Springs to work with a group of all different ages and backgrounds who were interested in living uh, in a different way the remainder of their life. 
And so we proposed this idea, working with them for a co-housing neighborhood, where they could live in homes that get all of their electricity and energy from the site, where they could have communal shared spaces, but also still have a personal home. And these ideas have been able to grow, and I've helped uh, architects and developers in Michigan, for example, where they're developing entire neighborhoods now based on this idea that the places that we live should connect us with the food that's grown and with our neighbors and with the place that we live in. And we've also been able to do this now with new buildings, with places where we work. In Connecticut, we just built this. This was just launched last year in Connecticut for a flooring manufacturing company who outgrew their existing building, had a really narrow site, and asked us, how could we create a place for our designers and artists and engineers to come and dream, escape the rush of the city, and just meditate? So the way that we do that is we work with biologists and we invite them to come with us, help teach us about the site, look at reference habitats, so that when we design the building, we can have an appropriate response that helps promote life. And so in this project, we built around a rock outcropping, lifted the building up, allowing people and animals to continue underneath, use native plants. And so now the community could come through, walk around, and enjoy a new park in this area where there wasn't anything like this. The building collects all of its own rainwater, produces more energy than it uses, and it provides a space inside and outside and above and beneath to occupy and to enjoy. And inside, we're trying to create places that promote health and well-being. And it's gonna be a place now where artists and designers can come and get inspired, and eventually this will be filled with art and artifacts. We also are working to transform existing buildings. We think that's important too, not to just build new buildings, but take our existing buildings, transform them into something that's unique and special. And so we work with ASHRAE in Atlanta, who sets the standard internationally for heating and cooling systems. And so they asked us to take this old building and to transform it into something that's really efficient on an affordable budget. So we gutted the whole building, we put in new um, efficient walls and windows, and the result is a completely transformed building around $250 a square foot, and just shows what's possible with existing buildings and to breathe new life into them that will last for the coming decades. We also think about what goes into our buildings. We got an opportunity to work with a carpet manufacturing company to help celebrate their new product, which was the first product to achieve living product certification. And we got inspired by nature, the place where we find reverie and we get uh, ideas from. So the idea was to create a carpet line that insp is inspired by lichen, which is kind of nature's carpet. And we developed a series based on unique species of lichen, different colors that you can put into a space and really bring nature inside and know that you're having a healthy product that isn't gonna cause harm. And it's had an incredible impact. It's saved the equivalent of almost 40 million plastic bottles, 12 million gallons of water just through how they manufacture and recycle this carpet. We've also done a project closer to home that perhaps some of you might be familiar with. We were on an amazing team working on the Climate Pledge Arena where we were asked as an architecture and sustainability consulting team what we could do to help make this project very regenerative and set a new standard in a venue like this. And so just some of the ideas that we proposed and that we implemented with the team were just to make it all electric, to use the ice rink and what if it could just be rainwater that's been collected, to ban single-use plastic, and to work with local food and beverage companies to get ingredients from locally rather than from across the country. And they were able to do it, and it's been an amazing success. And to see something start as a dream and an idea now impact thousands of people in one single building just shows the power and potential of ideas. And so that's something that I've been able to do for the last couple of years professionally as an architect. I also am an artist, and I love to just dream and to create spaces, and I love working with cities and communities to bring art and ideas to places that are otherwise have nothing special going on. And one of the ways that I just kind of relax is I just get a blank piece of paper and I just start doodling, and I just try to complete that picture, have no agenda, no idea of where it's going, and then I give it color. And it's a lot of fun to do that. That's a way to kind of just escape and just dream about what could be and to see this now um, dot our landscape in the homes and neighborhoods that I grew up in is really special. And I love to draw places that I've been to that are meaningful to me, and maybe to you, and started to work with friends. And in this building, we did our first mural working with Vibe. And the idea was to create an uplifting art that inspires people that are starting businesses. And to remind you, as soon as you walk in the building, of having momentum and plans for the future, but also who you potentially impact and the children of the future. 
and that we put our kids into the art. And we also wanted to make art that reminds us of the place that we live and the species around us, the little things that we have impact on. And just to share an example of being involved in communities, we were invited up to Friday Harbor in the San Juan Islands to do a 300 foot long mural on the busiest street, which just so happened to be right across from the mayor's house. So he watched over our shoulder uh, every day. And it was a lot of fun and we just brought a lot of color and whimsy. We invited the kids from the island to come join us and to make art. It caused a little bit of a ruckus. They did not want a graffiti town, but we knew all along we were gonna come over and paint art that just celebrates the island flora and fauna that make the islands so special. And so this brings me to the final idea, which is how can we bring all these ideas home? And so one way that I'm trying to practice reverie, regeneration, and recreation is to combine it with something that I'm passionate about, which is skateboarding and community. Love Polsbo, it has a wonderful downtown. Our skate park is not so great. It's 20 years old, it's wood, and it desperately needs to be updated. And so the idea that we've been sharing is what if we could create a year-round space for the community that's not just a skate park. I was able to help design one in Port Orchard and it's been a huge success. It's one of the biggest in the, in the state. And the idea is to create something special for all ages to come and enjoy that's usable year-round. And so we've shared these ideas, we've worked with the community, we worked with uh, Leadership Kitsap to paint the Public Works building with the idea that if this ever goes away, what could be done here? And so one of the ideas that we've shared is at Public Works, just behind this building, is what if in the future it goes away? Well, what if we could create a place for everyone to come and enjoy and really activate and celebrate this beautiful park that's just behind this building? With the idea being having a skate park, multi-use facility, bocce balls, have movies in the park. I think this would be a fun idea. And so just to share the idea, this is just an illustration of what it could look like to create a park that was right now just an industrial use, to open it up and bring life back there, celebrate the stream and the ecology, integrate Nordic art and architecture with the clock tower, and then have a covered skate park and an activity park for everyone. And so this is something I'm passionate about and share and hope it's inspiring to you in your business, with your ideas, with your dreams, to look around your neighborhood, your community, and try to find ways to dream and to do meaningful work with it. Thank you for your time. Hope this has been inspiring and helpful. What's the red list? I noticed in there there's <clears throat> products that are on the red list. What is that? Uh, red list is part of the living building challenge, which is this idea that when you want to build a building, it's a list of ingredients that are in gaskets, windows, insulation, fire retardants that have been shown to cause us cancer and harm. So the idea with what does it mean to build a living building and a healthy space to occupy, we, that list was created to kind of just identify don't use these ingredients. And so we worked with manufacturers and the Living Future Institute tries to work with companies to declare what's in your product. And so to do a living building, you can only use products that have been red list free. So it's shifting the entire manufacturing industry to declare their products, to be transparent, and to try to find ways to not use uh, ingredients, chemicals that harm us. That's what the red list is. Yeah. So what's the status with the skate park? I've been hearing about it for a while. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're gonna, we need to get that going. COVID slowed it down a lot. There's been a transition of parks directors, but I'm hoping that we can kind of breathe new life into it and get that going, because I think that would be special and beneficial for the community. So hopefully you all can be part of that. Yeah. Does, uh, does living building, does it have a certification like a lead building does? Yep. And um, how are you guys pursuing that? Like, obviously, things are changing in the manufacturing process. Yep. But how is that certification changing? Yep. So, uh, um, LEED is a certification for, for buildings, energy efficiency. And that's what our CEO kind of reacted to when he started. He worked uh, with Bob Berkabau, who helped create LEED. And after a few years doing that, realized this doesn't go in far enough right. to confirm and really post-occupancy 
validate that you're really doing something sustainable long term. So that's where the living building challenge came from was let's actually make it a lot harder and certify. So it's really difficult to do. It's a lot of checklists, but it is a certification and you can register any type of pro uh, project, a house, a school, office building uh, to try to pursue that. So it's, it's similar to LEED in that it's, you certify your project, but it tries to go a lot further and shift people to do good. And that's part of the, what the LEED building challenge is all about. So follow on to that, how do you convince the investor yeah. to spend the upfront money on a, on a more expensive building, yep. uh, knowing that they're going to save money seven to 10 years down the road, but that they have to spend that money today? Yep. How do you convince them to do that? We like to talk about the kind of life you want to live and the value of what you're getting. And so, yeah, you could do a cheaper building and it could be what we know it would be. Uh, but we try to talk about the potential impacts for people in place and the downstream impacts. And so that convinces a lot of people. A lot of the projects done by multiple architecture firms around the world now prove that this really is the smartest way forward if you value human health and wellness and if you value sustainability and smart use of our, just being a good steward of our resources. And so we try to talk about those dreams and visions, show examples, and make a compelling argument in that way. You're seeing that shift change a little bit now yep. to people saying, hey, actually, we want this. Yep. We'll pay more for it now. And it's, yeah, it's been around for uh, almost 20 years now, the Living Building Challenge. So there's been a lot of early adopters that right. proved it was possible. And now all over the world, there's projects that are doing this. The Ashray project in Atlanta was for $250 a square foot for a commercial office building, which is really good. Um, it was challenging to do that, but it just shows that on a humble budget, you can do living buildings. Yeah. yeah, I was really impressed to see that uh, you've actually adapted the model to apply to remodeling. Which is very mm -hmm. cool. I noticed also um, the, the the lichen carpeting yes. was amazing. I love the designs, but um, it said that it's the first certified living product. Yes. Can you say more about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So part of what we did at the Living Future Institute was start with the living building challenge idea but then expanded that to let's also certify products. So furniture, carpet, insulation, wall, paint. Let's work with companies who are producing these things to develop products that the market can, can acquire and, and buy. And so that's what the Living Product Challenge is. It was a way to celebrate companies and manufacturers that spent the time to do that. Um, and it's a rigorous process to not use toxic chemicals and to consider the employees and the working environments and water use that goes into creating our products that we use in buildings. Can I just say, it's kind of a yeah. fun fact. So this building, um, because the process is so rigorous, we did not get the final certification on it because yeah. it requires basically like four years of minutia documentation. <laughs> And we had so many staff transitions that we lost some of the documentation in between. But this building was actually designed for LEED certification. Yep. Um, and so, you know, this is reminding me, even working with um, Josh and Corey when we were doing the murals here, it's a whole process of even um, what paint products they were using to do murals, which the type of, you know, spray paints and things generally is not the type of products that's typically super um, mm -hmm. LEED certifiable. Yeah. So it was, you know, the whole process, like every single product that goes into these buildings is extremely time consuming. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of work that I think is being done and needing to be done in terms of those companies documenting what goes into their products because it's just this whole supply chain yep. challenge. Yep. And that's some, that's some people's entire jobs in our industry is trying to do a living building and their entire job is to go through every gasket, seal, glue, like glue. And if there's not a product available, we write those companies and we say, hey, can you tell us what's in your ingredients? If they don't do that, we send other letters. And it's really just trying to basically peer pressure companies to make good products. And we say, if something else comes available, we're not gonna use your product anymore. So it's really shifting the market and there's a lot of companies that are changing to try to make these things available uh, for our buildings. Yes? Um, I live on Bainbridge and I um, walk the neighborhoods and I noticed you have a 
building have something's happening on the south and then Bainbridge could you tell us about that? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So uh, our firm's based on Bainbridge Island. A few years ago we bought the Fort Ward building on the south end of the island. It's a historic World War II brick building that's just been vacant for uh, for decades. And so we are in the process of remodeling it and it's going to be our future office and kind of studio where we bring people from all over the world and teach regenerative design and work with communities on these very ideas. And so that's what we're doing on the island. It's a work in process, but we should be in there by the end of July. So we're excited about that. Um, that's the old Morse code school? Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of history with the building. It's really cool. We're excited to work out there. And I think uh, middle of July, we're having a big open house. So if you look for that, you're all invited to come in and check it out. How, yes. How often do you find yourself presenting with like what if instead of like we should or we recommend and how different are the reactions? Depends on your audience. Like every project and client's different. Uh, so our firm in particular, we really just try to only do projects that are like this. And we've been able to, to do that for over 10 years. And that's really unique. Not every practice gets to do that. But our approach is to just talk about these big picture goals, what kind of world we want to live in. And so it attracts people that are trying to do that. And so it helps us in those conversations when we try to encourage people to pursue living building challenge or to try something that's unnormal from what we're accustomed to. But it is a lot of like, well, what could be or how could we to try to get people to think and question kind of the status quo. And that's, it's helpful and it's effective to try to change mindsets to talk about what could be because we get so accustomed to just our normal day to day that it's nice to kind of wake people up and uh, dream about what's possible. There is another hand. Yes. For the skateboard part, you said yes. I'm hoping you know we can all help get started. What are those simple ways or more complex ways to get started? Uh, so that's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think. The next steps would be to get our community group together again to talk about where it could be. That's honestly just been the most difficult thing. If we talk about the skate park project for a second, is the hope with that is um, that we could have a park that's visible in a centrally located location that is connected with a park so it's not just a park thrown in the corner of the city. And so that's really the hardest space is working with the city and community to say, hey, could it be at Public Works? Is there another spot that is similar? approach and that's really what's behind that so I think the goal with that would be to get a, a meeting together work with the city and to bring these ideas up again uh, they kind of got paused during COVID um, and so that would be sort of the next steps as I see it uh, to just talk about these ideas again and to see what's possible um, I, I got to spend a couple years helping design parks all over the country and so it's like knowing what's possible that's kind of what we're, we're working towards uh, yes so I'm curious, are you currently still doing um, residential and commercial projects? Yes. Okay, and a follow-up quick question. What kind of materials are you guys using or promoting for framing material? Uh, so yeah, uh, two, two answers. Yes, we are interested in doing all sorts of work. Uh, schools, we work, I didn't get to show everything that we're doing, but homes, places that we work, uh, schools, Museums, we're, we're interested in anything that can help make a better future. With walls, uh, we like to do really insulated walls. You can use traditional lumber for that. That's been like FSC certified. Um, we also like to use SIPs, which are called structural insulated panels. They're kind of like Lego blocks in a way that come pre-manufactured and you just snap them together. They're super insulated. And we've used that on the ASHRAE project in Atlanta. And that's one of the ways we were able to really affordably reskin that entire building, have it be really insulated, um, and not have a lot of waste with construction material. Thank you. Yeah. Jay? I had the same question around the, the like one practical action step for folks, uh, particularly around the centennial work. So okay. Asked and answered. Um, yeah, uh, Instagram, it's called Polesville Skate Park. Uh, Follow that and we'll put out some announcements for some upcoming meetings and would love to have any help and ideas too with that. Yes. I have a quick comment on that. Yeah. Um, you could also talk to the Paulsville Farmers Market because they've been fighting for public works as well. Yeah. If you try to like 
have them come together so that they can be a part of that as well. Yep. I think that would be great for yeah. the community too. Yeah, love that. Do you know David Franklin? He's a skateboarder in Indianola, and he's an artist. Mm, I've heard the name. Yeah, I've heard the name. Yeah. He's the artist who did the uh, the carved kraken tentacle down by the Bainbridge Ferry. Oh, cool. Awesome. Do you introduce us? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. All right. Let's give Joshua a keep going. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and he truly has so many more projects to share. <laughs> so keep asking questions, follow up. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of really beautiful work that he has to show off. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.